lawyer and non-scientist Philip Johnson pretends to be attacking evolutionary theory and critiquing evolutionary theory. However, he is not. The complaints that he has have absolutely nothing at all to do with evolutionary theory. He is attacking that which scientists do not claim and do not assert and therefore do not defend. That is why Philip Johnson attacks those positions. He knows damn well they're not defended. What he claims to be evolutionary theory is not. This is why he is a lawyer and not a biologist. Evolution, Fact or Fantasy by Philip E. Johnson That's right, Philip Johnson, the lawyer. I know whenever I have a question regarding biology, I go talk to a lawyer. I certainly wouldn't go to talk to a biologist if I have a biology question. That would just be, you know, silly. Evolution is a fact, only at a very small scale. Evolution doesn't have any scale at all. Evolution is an observed fact. There's no small scale involved. There's no large scale involved. Evolution, a fact, an observed fact. It is a fantasy when it is used to explain how plants and animals came into existence. Evolution is not used to explain how anything in the biosphere came to exist. Evolutionary theory is. Or how human beings supposedly evolved from ape-like ancestors. Human beings, of course, are apes. If evolution merely refers to a... Evolution, of course, does not refer to anything. The word evolution, of course, does. The word evolution refers to how life on Earth changes. That is all the word evolution means. Process of cyclical back and forth variation in response to changing environmental conditions. Then evolution is a fact. No, evolution isn't cyclical variation back and forth, whatever the bloody hell that means. Evolution is merely a change in a population's genome over time. This is, of course, due to mutation and natural selection, all of which, of course, is observed fact. For example, when a population of insects is sprayed with a deadly chemical like DDT, the most susceptible insects die, but the individuals most resistant to the poison survive to breed and leave offspring. Yes, that is one example of natural selection in action. That is, of course, how a gene's population changes over time. It has absolutely nothing to do with cyclical variation. It is natural selection. Throw in mutation and you've got evolution. Such changes are not permanent, however. Such changes are often permanent when the genes involved become fixed in the population's genome. <sighs> this is what happens when you ask a lawyer questions about biology. Because the resistant mosquitoes are more fit than the others only for as long as the insecticide is applied. No. Uh, resistance to pesticide is only good as long as the genes that exist in the genome of the population is still relatively high. If it becomes fixed, then that species population will always have a resistance to that pesticide. If it is not fixed, if the there are individuals that do not have the genes that make resistance to pesticide. Natural selection will no longer need to select individuals to resist that pesticide if the pesticide is removed from the environment. This is just basic kindergarten evolutionary theory to say that it's just back and forth due to the environment is just stupid. It is back and forth due to the genome, not the environment. It's not environmental pressures. You have a gene, an entire species population. It has a frequency through that population unless it is fixed. If it is fixed, it, then it is in every single individual in that species population. If it is not fixed, natural selection will select for and against it. The point being, and what lawyer Johnson refuses to acknowledge, is that genes can and do and have been observed to do to become fixed in a species population. That is, every single individual has the genes. Once again, kindergarten evolutionary theory, which lawyer Johnson just refuses to acknowledge. 
They involve no increase in complexity or appearance of new body parts or even permanent change of any kind. There is no such thing as complexity in the biosphere. If you doubt me, define complexity. Define more complexity. Define less complexity. I dare you. I'll give you 30 years to do so. Small-scale reversible population variation of this sort are usually called microevolution. There is, of course, no such thing as microevolution, nor is there macroevolution. The terms went out of use among scientists 60 years ago in the 1940s. You will only see creationists using the terms microevolution and macroevolution. You will also see some popularizers of science also use the terms, but they are using the terms for a readership who is basically pretty fundamentally ignorant on the subject, so they dumb down the subject so that uh, lay readers can understand it. Macroevolution, macroevolution, neither exists. There is only evolution. It is misleading to describe adaptive variation as evolution, because the latter term commonly refers also to macroevolution. No, evolution does not refer to microevolution or macroevolution. Scientists don't use those terms except when they're talking to idiots. Macroevolution is the grand story of how life supposedly evolved by purely natural processes. Macroevolution doesn't exist, therefore it's not a story, it's not even a natural phenomena. There is only evolution. Without God's participation being needed at any step along the way. Evolutionary theory is made up of tens of millions of bits of pieces of information. Direct observations, extrapolations, interpolations, raw data, all of which none mention the gods at all. There is nothing in the theory of evolution that states that the gods did not have a hand in life uh, starting or diversifying. Evolutionary theory is completely silent on the subject of the gods. It does not say the gods do not exist. It does not say the gods did not create life on Earth. It does not say that the gods did not diversify life on Earth. Theory of evolution, utterly neutral on the subject. Charles Darwin assumed that macroevolution was merely microevolution extended over very long periods of time. No, Charles Darwin did not assume that. Also, it has been 149 years since Charles Darwin published his book on the origin of species. Since that time, the theory of evolution has accumulated a massive amount of more information than Charles Darwin had in the original theory. Stating what Charles Darwin thought or believed is totally irrelevant, irrelevant to what is current evolutionary theory. Why in the hell even bring up Charles Darwin? It makes no bloody sense. Unless one is being deliberately dishonest, which of course Philip Johnson is always constantly being.